Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, uh, work session of the Larimer County Board of Commissioners. Today is Monday, August 19, 2019. I'm Tom Donnelly, Chairman of the Board of Commissioners this year, uh, joined by John Cavallos, Commissioner from District 1. Steve Johnson, Commissioner from District 2, is excused from this hearing today, um, or this work session today, rather. Uh, we have a number of items on the agenda, so I'm going to uh, ask Lori Kadrich, our Interim Director of Community Planning, Infrastructure, and Resources, if she'd like to make any introductory comments. Yes, I would. Hi. How are you today? Great. Good. I have a bit of good news since I got teased last week for never having good news. <laughs> so I want to report that uh, the grant application that we put in that has that acronym FLAP mm -hmm. through Natural Resources, and that was a $6 million dollar seven million dollar grant application looks like we're going to receive the funding uh, we have a 99 percent certainty of that and so that will enable um, nearly 10 million dollars of infrastructure work to be done at the reservoir systems related to roads and parking lots great and so that's our good news and in addition to that we have three items on the agenda today and eric is going to start uh, with some information about the wellington fire department great did you get the memo I sent you, or did you want hard copies of that? I'd like a hard copy, please. I don't know. So as a, let me actually first introduce our guests, and then I'll give you a brief introduction and let them speak. We have three representatives from the Wellington Fire Protection District here. Let's start with Ashley McDonald, who's has a long title. I'm just told to call it Community Risk Reduction. <laughs> and Everett Petter, who's the How's fire that working? <laughs> Good. And, and Gary Green is the fire chief. Um, as Welcome Commissioner chief. Donnelly knows, and Commissioner Kapalas is probably somewhere in the process of learning the way the process works for adopting fire codes in the county is uh, the fire district adopts the fire code, and then the county board of commissioners has to approve administration of the code in the unincorporated Larimer County part of the district. So it comes to you for approval, and then the Wellington Fire Department or other departments can enforce their code. Um, they are now have adopted the 2018 International Fire Code with certain amendments, and there are certain things I wanted to bring to the attention of the board to make sure you were on board with it because sometimes you have concerns or questions about them. Um, I haven't sent you the entire fire code that they adopted. I can do that if you like, but I highlighted what I think are the sections that you might have any concerns or questions about, and then I thought the folks from Wellington could talk to you directly about it. Um, first of all, there was a new section. There's a section in the fire code that requires operational permits for all kinds of things, and there's a new section added requiring operational permits for care facilities within a dwelling. And I know this board has expressed some concern about um, in-home family daycares. Um, there's also an amendment to the definition section. They actually made it less restrictive than the code that says a care facility that has eight or fewer persons can be um, regulated under the International Residential Code, which in our residential code does not require sprinklers. Mm -hmm. Um, probably the biggest changes are in section 903, which is where it says when fire sprinklers are required, and they've tightened up some of the requirements for when sprinklers would be required to be installed in commercial occupancies, um, reducing the occupant load down to 50 or the square footage from 12 to 6,000. You know, and they can explain the thinking behind that and make sure you're supportive of that. Um, there's also a section requiring sprinklers in townhouses built under the residential code. Um, I don't believe we've ever permitted a townhouse in the unincorporated county area near Wellington if there are any that are built in town, but that, that would be a change. Um, a minor amendment, there's an exception in the code that allows you to have a key lock in the front door of an assembly occupancy with a sign that says this door to remain unlocked, but it would lower the threshold again to 50 people. Um, and then finally, some sections that would um, require sprinklers in existing buildings when they're undergoing additions or alterations if they're over 6,000 square feet. Oh, and the final one that I think may be of some interest or concern to you is um, if you have a tent, you're required to get an operational permit from the fire department if it's 400 square feet or more being used for a commercial occupancy like a wedding tent, and they would propose to lower that from 400 to 200. So I just wanted to bring those out and then let them speak about their code and get direction from the board. If you're in approval, I'll then go through the normal process of bringing it forward to the board for your approval at a um, admin <coughs> matters meeting. Chief, do you have any comments? I, certainly, I do. Thank you very much for allowing us to come here today and talk about this. Um, our staff, um, Captain Pettit and Ashley McDonald, have worked really hard, um, not with just myself, but with uh, neighboring fire districts, um, Loveland and um, Pooter Fire Authority, to name a, a couple that we've worked with very closely. 
as well as uh, Windsor Severance. We think that it's important that um, fire districts that are in close proximity, uh, if we can align the majority of our um, fire code amendments, that makes it easier on developers um, that are moving from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Some of the things that Eric brought up, we'll be happy to field any questions you have relative to that. Um, the sprinkler requirements that we've adjusted on here, um, while they are slightly more restrictive on most um, occupancies than what we adopted in 2012, um, we feel like it simplifies. Um, rather than ranging from 5,000 to 10,000 and everything in between, um, that particular table um, is uh, incorporates both type of construction and um, type of occupancy. Uh, as it relates to the unincorporated parts of the county where this comes into play, everything is going to be sprinklered in our fire district in unincorporated parts of the county simply because there's no municipal water supply in the area. Um, so another section of the code will require the sprinklers before you ever get to this particular stage. Um, this is this code is already and these code amendments have already been adopted by the town of Wellington, mm -hmm. and um, uh, as I said, the majority, the vast majority of our requirements, including sprinkling of townhomes, are in alignment with Poudre Fire Authority and other jurisdictions in Northern Colorado. Any questions, Sean? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chief, and thank you all for being here. Uh, a c couple of questions with regard to the. Um, perhaps more restrictive uh, fire sprinkler uh, requirements. Um, did, the, uh, did you have the opportunity to engage uh, builders, developers, to get their feedback on, on these proposed changes to the, to the fire code? We did. We had an information meeting in which we um, invited the primary builders in our community right now, home builders in our community right now, so Sage Homes and um, Hartford Homes both attended that session and neither one of them had comments. Um, actually, um, one gentleman from Hartford Homes did have a question. He just wanted to know if he's already underway with a townhome development, which he is in our jurisdiction. Is this gonna be retroactive to <laughs> his development? We said no, it will be moving forward with any other mm -hmm. future development agreement, so. Yeah, I continue with yeah, my questions absolutely. yet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Chief, that's helpful. And just to make sure I understood what you said earlier about some of the rationale behind um, uh, distinguishing different types of developments regarding um, sprinkler requirements, it, rather than having it more generic, you know, from this square footage to this square footage, right. you're suggesting that if it's a commercial development or a residential development, certain uh, uh, square footages, that would inform the requirements or what would need to be done in terms of fire safety or, or sprinkler systems? Yes. Did uh, I get that right? You did. Um, it, it's a very complicated sort of table that's made up. So I'm learning words, that everything in this job is rather complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, however, the, the point that I was trying to um, assert was that even this particular requirement will have no bearing because until unless someone puts in a municipal water supply in the rural parts of our fire district which is the unincorporated Larimer County. So the sprinklers are gonna be required whether we adopt this amendment or not because there is no water supply in those areas. And if I may, how does this, uh, these proposed uh, amendments to the code uh, that, that, that the Wellington Fire Protection District has adopted the 2018 International Fire Code, how does this align with what we approved a while back regarding the Lions Fire Protection District. I don't think Lions changed the commercial parts of their code, but they did require sprinklers in all new residential development. Yeah. These guys aren't proposing that. No, they're not. They're not proposing sprinklers in all new homes, just in townhouses, of which I don't think we've ever permitted any in the unincorporated Wellington area. And, and then perhaps my last question, for, for at least for the moment, is regarding the first two bullet points. Could uh, could someone expand on that? What the implications are for? Um, uh, I think uh, Eric mentioned that uh, uh, there's been a change as far as uh, in-home uh, child care facility and, and uh, would this uh, make it more difficult to operate an in-home child care facility, being mindful of safety of the children. Uh, could someone expand on that, please? 
I'll let these guys talk, or I can fill in any of the gaps that you guys should have a chance to talk. No, yeah, we'll put it all in the chief. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody, nobody's ever accused me of being shy, so I'll talk all day if you want. <laughs> so, your question again? Yes, my question has to do with uh, I think in particular the uh, the first two bullet points: new set requiring operational permit for care facilities, and then the. Uh, Resi the occupancy classification residential group three, I understand that there, there are implications for in-home uh, child care um, uh, centers, and, and I'd like to better understand what that means. Sure, working with the community and realizing that there's a need for those daycares. Uh, we've tried to work as close as we can with the, the state's uh, guidelines for child care, um, and in that process, we've looked at the... Um, Appendix M for residential, and we've feel like we've got a, a pretty good compromise with uh, feeling that need for the community and providing a, a safety aspect to that. Mm -hmm. Actually, relax the regulation a little. Yes, okay. I think probably helpful here, or it's so expensive anyway. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Eric, uh, I think the chief mentioned that the town of Wellington has already. Um, approved this, uh, these code changes. Um, when would the Board of County Commissioners take action on this? Well, if you're in support of these, then I would go ahead and uh, run it by Janine because she reviews all the resolutions, and then I would set up something for one of your um, Tuesday work sessions. I don't think I could get it admin. next Tuesday. but I mean, yeah, sorry, Tuesday admin meetings. But, um, you know, we could do that in the next couple of weeks. Okay. We think you should probably bring it forward as quick as you can. Okay. Very good. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. Thank Great you so you. much. Yeah, good news. work. Thank you. Super. All right. Yeah. Can you do that good? Can you bring something that, uh, <laughs> that <quick>? non-controversial <laughs> to us? We'll see. Tom. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Come on. You know how people feel about their animals. We know. <laughs> we know. I had to get, you know, I had to get a golden retriever because I didn't have any other friends. And uh -huh. it's the friendliest kind of dog. So that's why I had to pick it, that kind. So, and is he making a good friend? She is. She's she my is. best friend, yeah. Oh, good. She's the only, yeah, the only person that likes me frequently most many days. So. <laughs> well. <laughs> Except for you. I hate to point this out, but if you wanted people to like you. In the wrong business. You may be in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> I was just having lunch with some guys, and I was just telling them, I said, you know, 10 years of this, you make 20 people mad every week on, in land use. I mean, that's a lot. Over you, 10 years, that's a hell of a lot of people, you know? You also probably make it. Five happy. Five happy. Okay. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to give you 10. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. All right. Well, anyway, why don't you introduce yourself? To you? All right. I'm Judy yeah. Calhoun, CEO of Larimer Humane Society, and I'm going to let everyone um, else and um, with me from Larimer Humane Society is Marty Kennedy, our Director of Finance. Oh, hi, Marty. Hello. How are you? Very well, and thank you. You know the other yeah. right? <laughs> two folks? Karin. Okay. All right. So, um, what I'm going to do today is just go over a little bit of the um, background on how we developed and the information on how we developed the um, current animal control contract valuation formula. So you have some idea of um, how yeah. that's been done. Do you want me to do this now? Yeah. Uh, they have it. Oh, um, they have it. But we don't yeah. have a hard copy in front yeah, of you us. can roll it over. So why don't you okay. sort of slide it over. So. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. So um, to begin with, in the contract, this is a um, brief summary of the services that are provided under the contract. So you get um, shelter care, veterinary services, our animal protection and control department, so that's both our field and dispatch. Um, licensing for dogs are required in the unincorporated areas of Larimer County, and it's optional for cats. Um, there's a certain amount of community outreach around the animal control services, um, some support services for that, and then also the rabies vaccine. Oh, and I mistyped. Um, database. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Good. No problem. Ad. Is that a captured dog right there, or is that some kind of staged photo? That's uh, a staged photo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, and then um, we also provide... <laughs> Humane education, foster care, have a transfer program. We have an 
in our new facility at Community Beautiful. Dog Park, which I know both of you, I believe both of you have seen. Mm -hmm. um, we have teaching partnerships with both CSU Veterinary Teaching Hospital as well as Front Range Community College for their veterinary technician program. We host community meetings and events at our, in our community room. Um, we get community support. Um, and then most of what we do that's related to emergency planning and response is um, not under contract services, but a part of it is. So the evacuation portion we are able to do because we do have the field, but the animal care, that type of thing, the housing, all of that support, we would do whether or not we have the contracts. So, so a little bit on the methodology. Um, we took a look at the cost to perform each service, and then based on some different formulas for each service, we, port, we allocate a portion of that to each of the jurisdictions. So um, City of Fort Collins, City of Loveland, and unincorporated <coughs> Larimer County. And then we also do, because we are projecting ahead, so right now we're projecting for 2020, so we are using our information for our, our budget information for our FY 20 budget, which started July 1 of 19 and ends June 30th of 20. But we do account for history of how much budget to actual we normally use. Um, so by cost, what we're referring to is cost driver. For shelter care, we use our intake statistics and that includes um, all strays from the jurisdictions and a portion of the owner surrenders. Veterinary care is that same intake statistics. Animal protection and control is all of your assigned hours because each jurisdiction has, well, you and Loveland have very similar hours and then Fort Collins has more expanded um, hours of service and number of um, officers in the field. Um, so right now you have um, eight hours a day service seven days a week. Hmm. Um, then licensing is based on the number of licenses sold, the cost. Community outreach activities or marketing um, and those outreach activities that come under the contract are based on the human population in <coughs> each area. And then support services, we do basically a fixed percentage and it's based on a combination of the licenses sold and the human population. And then overnight dispatch, we do, so we dispatch our own officers from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Overnight, we turn that dispatch over to Sheriff's Office Dispatch. Mm -hmm. So um, that's based again on the assigned hours. Um, you will see on the revenue the sort of credit side that because that's the sheriff's mm -hmm. office, um, you get a full credit for everybody's cost of overnight dispatch. So then the, the cost calculation. <laughs> Good picture. We gotta put the pictures in yeah. to entertain you. <laughs> that's a good one. Because I'm not very entertaining on this stuff. Not as good as that guy. Yeah, no yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so we take the total cost, then we credit each jurisdiction for their related revenue. So you're credited for licensing in your jurisdiction. You're credited for the impound fees for those animals that are returned to their owner. So the stray animals whose owners pay, come reclaim them and pay um, impound and boarding fees. You are credited for those. And then Larimer County is credited for that overnight dispatch. So we take those credits and then we come up with the net <coughs> animal control contract costs. Okay. Any questions up to now? John, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Nice to see you. And Good to all, see you. All of you. Uh, so just so I better understand, with regard to licensing mm -hmm. uh, credits, so let's say a um, uh, hundred people uh, secured uh, licenses for their dogs or their cat, well, mm -hmm. for their dogs, let's say, and uh, the, the, they paid a total of let's say ten thousand dollars in fees mm -hmm. then that amount would be credited to the county as far as what we owe the against that total cost correct 
Yeah. And you're going to show us an example with the real numbers. In so a you've got the real numbers. Oh, I didn't okay. put it. it oh, okay. It's too small to put up here. Oh, so, okay. yes. Yeah, so, John, um, your Whoa. last year, well, actually, it's again, even the revenue is budgeted numbers. So, um, not last year's numbers. So, this is budgeted. So, you are. Our expectation is that licensing revenue would bring in a, a little over two hundred thousand dollars for that's you, right. so that's credited against the overall amount. The that overall amount the county mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. pay to Humane Society for providing services, animal right. services. Because we wouldn't get those fees if we weren't doing the contract. So, um, in the other jurisdictions that are not listed on your chart. Mm -hmm. uh, other than Fort Collins and Loveland, and then of course the county, um, how are uh, animal ser animal protection services provided to the other jurisdictions, like incorporated areas like Wellington, uh, Estes Park, uh, Berthet, et cetera? So with Wellington, um, Tinmouth, Johnstown, Berthet, um, and Estes Park, although Estes Park does not use us very much, they each have their own. Um, either animal Bound. control officer or code enforcement. It's often combined with code enforcement. Um, they, we have what we call um, a per call, contracts on a per call per animal basis. So um, if they call us for backup services and an officer goes out, um, they're charged for, on, for that call specifically. So if someone from Estes Park, uh, they need to license their uh, their uh, their family member. Mm -hmm. uh, where does where does that credit go to if it's in Estes Park? It actually goes to you. Yay! <laughs> to John specifically. Well, it goes to Larimer County. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. And I presume Estes Park knows that. Um, I they yes I. They're listening. Um. Because it's considered part of unincorporated Larimer mm -hmm. County. Um, yeah, so, it's yeah. a weird, it, because a, they, they run their own, they have their own little pound. They do the have town, their own. But only inside the town limits, right? Correct. And we still have, so we serve the rest of Estes Valley. Okay. And, oh. John, that's one thing that we have looked at over the years of figuring out a way that might make more sense to for us to help the town of Estes um, and there we haven't quite worked out a perfect <laughs> solution nice, for very it. diplomatic we haven't given up yeah well, it's, it's kind of an interesting deal too because if you lose your if you lose your dog and um, he gets picked up outside of town he goes he comes to down to comes Loveland to, to this yeah. to the Humane Society and if he if he's lost and picked up in Estes Park he goes to Estes Park and so you know, it's probably confusing for people who lose their dogs. They might get a mm -hmm. fair amount of misinformation, and, and you know, it's kind of a, it's a tough deal on two providers. But I, go, I didn't mean to interrupt you, John. Go ahead. Not at all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Judy, uh, on the subject of licensing, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the information that Karen has provided to us. Why did we take away the senior discount, and what would it take to get it back? Um, well, so the reason. Um, Last year, we took a look at all of the licensing fees, and because we had not increased our um, licensing fees in, I want to say it was seven or eight years, mm -hmm. um, working with all three of the jurisdictions, we recommended some increases there. The senior license had not changed in... I want to say the research we did was like 20 yeah, years. It's like 20 or 25 years. Yeah. Um, wow. And so our recommendation was to just go for altered animals, mm -hmm. um, a flat $15 for every one. Um, for you to reinstate that. Isn't it true that Fort Collins and Loveland have somehow managed to retain the discounts so loveland did actually loveland made their um licenses free for seniors they are picking up that additional cost so that is an additional cost in their contract um 
And how much are regular licenses in Loveland? Also 15? 15, okay. yes. yes. And Larimer County, so that, this, this was a proposal mm -hmm. from the Humane Society. We were the first ones to look at that proposal and vote on it. And Loveland and Fort Collins kind of came after that and made some changes to those those senior um, fees. So yeah. what's, what's Fort Collins? Like? So what Fort Collins has done is they are doing income for um, uh, residents who are 62 and older and receiving certain um, income qualified Fort Collins services, they Fort Collins is then paying for their license. So it's means tested in it's Fort means Collins. It's means tested, and Great. they are actually sending us not a check, but they're they're making an electronic payment um, on a monthly basis I think for that if I remember I, correctly. I want to say so but I've not been there long enough to I think it's quarterly and it seems if I remember the data correctly the first quarter we got more phone calls than we had expected but that's because people got confused when they were reading who gave a discount so most of those calls were for other communities and not for Fort Collins and what just prior to leaving, I believe there were four or five people who were income qualified. Per quarter or? Total? Per, in total, out of maybe 2,000 or 2,500 renewals that had gone out. And somebody had to do the income qualification to pay the $15 and everything? Yes, sir. It'd be better just to give them the $15 if they would have just asked for it. Than to I believe that was a proposal that was suggested. That had to be. What are the cost implications for, for the city of Loveland to waive the, the um, fee for seniors? And are seniors defined as 65 and older or 62 and older? Or they, define it, they define it as 62 and over. So um, for them, it's approximately $60,000 a year. Judy, if I might add to uh, some Sorry. of the research that we did, commissioners, on this fee schedule is that this was the only senior discount given in the front range. There were no other communities doing anything similar. Communities long ago had gone to a flat rate fee for licensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and it's much more, it's much steeper if it's, it's an unaltered, mm -hmm. yeah, so intact for, animal, right? right? intact animal, it's, it's a $50. Oh, it's um, only 50? I thought it was 100. Mm -hmm. Nope, it's 50. Oh, I thought that license. guy said 100 in an email the, he sent us. Maybe the, he had two dogs that were intact. Yeah, I don't yeah, know, I don't yeah. know. The but. other thing that no, we can- There's never been a senior discount for intact animals. Yeah. It was always just for altered animals. Right. So the other thing I might mention is that this was at least a consideration of ours when we looked at it, is that this is not something that animal control officers go out and proactively enforce for. So it's not like we're going out and looking for animals that are not licensed. Mm -hmm. The time that this might come up as some kind of offense is if the animal actually does something. So the, wow. some of the thinking was that for people who have senior companion pets, most of those pets are indoors or with the owner at all times. We really didn't think this was gonna be a burden to those folks. You don't have to license a cat? In Larimer County, it is not required, correct. In, but in, 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 no, no, in throughout, this, throughout the county, or is that different in, in the cities? In the cities, it is required. Oh, so get a cat. It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> so what would it take for the county to and have to a senior you. discount? That is... Yeah, so that's John's question. Maybe, so break this down for us, maybe. So, um, there, the total fees, is this is this 20, 2020? What is um, this? This is data from 2019, or is this estimated? For 2020... Licensed we, revenue, you have 201503 mm -hmm. That is That is based on our budget. Okay, so, so that, that is a budgeted number. Okay, um, but it's to be close to what the real world is, right? I mean, it, it tends to be close most years. It's right about on track. This year, because some of the challenges with the licensing fee changes, we actually were a little bit under our budgets, mm -hmm. and and we're not we're not asking for that money back. That's so so you essentially so what you believe in twenty twenty is you'll collect about two hundred thousand in in license your revenue. Mm -hmm. And then that the total county contract will be four hundred and sixteen, mm -hmm. and so the county the or, um, no the total would be four hundred and forty. So the the four sixteen four forty. What's four sixteen then? Down at the that's twenty eighteen. Well, that's tw no. It says net twenty twenty contract. Mm -hmm. Oh net, no. Or sorry, 
That's net. Yeah, net 440. Oh, so that so the total contract is 600,000? The total contract is 664. Oh, okay. And then all of your credits bring it down okay, to Okay, to brown, bring it down to 440. Which is that's different than what I said on the phone maybe. I'm not sure. Where does that number show up? Oh, Paid by jurisdiction. Earlier. This okay. is the one that came Well, the one you gave us says 416, okay. I think. But okay. That's fine. 440. Okay. Okay, and so John's question is how many of these, how many of this, how much of this um, $201,000 comes from license or uh, senior licensing? Do you have any idea or estimation about that? Well, so in calendar year 2018, okay. um, we sold um, 3,354 senior licenses. Okay. If you multiply that by 15. 15 that's 50,310. Oh, so that's what you said. You already said mm -hmm. that, didn't you? You thought it would be about 60,000. Okay. Yeah, so no, that's a little over 50. I just want to make sure I understand. That would be the total cost. That's that wouldn't the total. that wouldn't cover the increase because mm -hmm. there was a fee for a senior license. Right. So that's the total cost. Correct. Yes. If oh, we that'd just be that'd be, that'd be the and that's what Loveland chose to do okay, is to right. subsidize the entire license. Okay. And so what was the license before? It was fifteen, like five. Five. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if it was so five, it'd be it's forty. Then a third you, of that. Yeah. Yeah. You'd, right. you'd save a third of it, so it'd be forty. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So. So, so it's if I may last on this point. Yeah, uh, and can I just also say because we've done all of the printing, so um, <laughs> all of the uh -oh. all of the programming, there would be new printing and new programming costs. Okay. And I would want to have a conversation with Lori about that. Yeah. To me, if the other jurisdictions are not changing their fees. Those additional costs you have to reprint everything. would need to be absorbed by Larimer County if that's what you are changing. It's not in the overall scheme of things. It's not necessarily huge, but I don't feel like it's fair given that we did that for everybody this year, absorbed it in in our FY19 budget, to then charge them a second time in understand. 2020. We understand. So, yeah. So in summary on this point, so you can move on with your presentation, I'm understanding that if the county were to pursue uh, some type of uh, senior discount uh, licensing, mm -hmm. uh, one option is to perhaps bring it back to the $5, uh, you know, for un I, I, that would be for um, altered animals. Mm -hmm. It's more... Uh, Correct. So unaltered animals, the discount would not apply? Correct. It never has. Very good. So bringing it back to $5, the, the overall cost plus some... Uh, printing costs would be about forty thousand dollars added to the current contract. If we were to make it zero, it would be about fifty thousand dollars, perhaps, in addition to some printing costs. Sixty. Or, sixty. Yeah. With the printing. Ten thousand for mm -hmm. reprinting. Well, no, sixty was uh, to bring it uh, all the way back down to zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is what Loveland did. From fifteen to zero. Fifteen to. 15 to 10 would be 40, and so 15 and, to 0 would be 60. Okay, thank you. And the third option were, would be to keep it the way it is. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Interesting. So are you going to increase our fee this year? Is that your proposal? Well, so <laughs> our costs are going up. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yes, there is an, there's an increase. And over the past two it's years, okay. we have been working with all three jurisdictions to help bring you all in line with this new formula, valuation. So we've actually been through some of the sales tax tail money. We've been using that money to subsidize the contracts with the idea that by 2020, all three of you would be up to the norm, the, this cost based on this formula. So what's the increase proposal? It's uh, three, three point. So the four, current four percent increase. Um, in preparing, Kristen has been preparing the budget for community development, and as part of that, with this increase, she has submitted a service proposal in the amount of sixty-five thousand eight hundred and seventy dollars. Just to cover the to increase. cover the humane society contract, in addition to the funding that was 
it, it allocated to be put into the budget for 2020. Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Karen. So uh, if the commissioners decided to address the, the uh, uh, licensing fees for older adults, is there still time to uh, adjust your the community development service proposal? I would refer to Leslie on the timing of budget. Okay, so we had submitted a service proposal um, with our budget in the amount of 65870 and if the Board of County Commissioners decided to do something with the senior licensing fee in addition to that amount, do we have time to include that in the current budget proposals? Thank you. Thank you. And then, Chairman, if yeah. I might ask, if, do you have any idea, has there been a request for a senior discount fee for unincorporated area? Are we getting a lot of calls this first year with renewal or? Yeah, we've received two, I think. Go well, ahead, John. Yeah, in response to that, we've, uh, as Com Commissioner Donnelly s s um, stated, we've not gotten a, a tsunami of, of mm -hmm. calls but there have been uh, there were um, I mean I the, the one that I still have on my voicemail from April saying what's going on here these are important to us mm -hmm. changing demographics sometimes we have more than one pet if you're on fixed income it's challenging etc so there hasn't been a whole lot and I think I did ask uh, the Humane Society if you had any data that showed maybe you were getting a spike in concerns or that sort of thing I know that we've gotten calls. I do not believe that we've kept track of the number of calls specifically. Um, I, I'm just struck by, right, how we yeah. discussed early on to take care of this would be to include a small amount of money into the budget, maybe $2,500, and that when we received a call, the staff person could screen that call and either pay the difference, the $10 difference from the 5 to the 15 mm -hmm. rather than have an income-qualified process or a one-stop for everyone because um, there is a general belief that many people are not affected by this fee increase, and those that are, we might be able to handle with a phone call. Yeah. If that's something the commissioners would like us so to consider, your approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I be, appreciate that'd that. That'd be, I think, more reasonable. Yeah. And just so you know, <coughs> the Loveland City Council meeting, um, I believe one person spoke in favor, but several, two or three, actually spoke against it, and it was a proposal that came up that night. Mm -hmm. so, spoke against the fee waiver. Correct. Because people came out were, to speak against it. Mm -hmm who were seniors and who felt like they did not need that um, waiver. Well, one could make the case that those seniors, not to generalize, uh, that were able to come to that council meeting and, and express their opinion are probably, uh, it, it's easier for them to do that and, and maybe that they don't have the financial need, absolutely. Yeah. Commissioner, that's exactly what our team had talked about us. We did feel that many of the people who were qualified for that age we're able to take care of this and absorb it, but there are those who may not be able to, and it'd be great to have some set aside funds to take care of that. So how would we go about doing that? And you're saying that we would, through the Humane Society, when people go to license their, their dog, uh, how would we inform people that this option is available to, yeah, to, what to help mitigate the impact? We would wait for them to ask. But I mean, how would they know that the county has set aside $2,500 to help you know, mitigate the the, uh, yeah. the cost burden, perhaps. I think that we might want to think about this piece of it a little bit more with Judy, because mm -hmm. what we had originally talked about is that if people, when they called in for their renewal or wrote back a note on their renewal, said, this is a hardship for me, that then who, whatever the agency is could get a call from the Humane Society and we could follow up on those one-on-one because -on -one, we didn't think there'd be a lot of them. And before we would advertise something, because I remember all of this vividly, there are documents of this program that's gone out to all the veterinarian offices because they all do licensing, plus all over town. And we may not want to change those and may be able to approach it in a different way by the renewal letter itself. 
So I think based on this conversation, and I appreciate you giving me all, giving us all this time, I think this is a proper way to, to approach this problem, that perhaps uh, if we need to modify the service proposal, uh, $2,500 sounds better than uh, perhaps $60,000, and that working together, figuring out a proper way to notify people, uh, that would be a gesture on our part to uh, fiscally responsibly to address concerns that have been brought to us if in a year or two time we get uh, two or three hundred people saying this is a real burden, then we can revisit that. Exactly. So please pursue that. Is that okay with you? With you? Yeah, I think we'd want to talk to Commissioner Johnson. I, you know, I'll just tell you um, personally. I, you know, I, I'm I'm a little lukewarm on this idea. I mean, you know, in Loveland, I do pay nine additional mills or almost ten additional mills in property tax. Most of those seniors in Loveland are paying that as well, and so. Um, <coughs> When the county subsidizes fees, it's it's using tax revenue from people in Port Collins and people in Loveland to do so as well. And so, um, I, I'm a little I'm a little hesitant to do it. I mean, I don't. But at the same time, I appreciate that John is trying to to try to help some people out who are in, in tough spots. And so, um, it is a it is important to us that that we give people options to try to age in place and try to stay in their homes as long as possible. And having animals is really important for that. And so. Um, I'd be inclined to support this proposal that, that you guys have, have mentioned. I will say this, though. My son picked up a dog, mm -hmm. and we live in Loveland. Yes. <laughs> My son picked up a dog and um, I, on the weekend, and I mm -hmm. called the Humane Society, mm -hmm. and I left a message. And guess what? I would never call back. I had to find the owner of the dog through Facebook. Okay. I found the dog, and the Humane Society never even responded to me. And so this is supposed to be seven-day-a-week service. And so yes, anything is. that we do that undermines the, our ability to provide service, mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's cutting f funding, I'm, I, I think that, that there are some actual issues with that. And so I want to make sure that, that we don't get something here that, that, we, uh, that we collapse. On. I mean, that's what, unfortunately, in 2008 and 2009, 9 and 10, mm -hmm. we significantly cut the Humane Society budget. Mm -hmm. when we were, in, we right. were in the revenue right. uh, mm -hmm. shortfalls. And we didn't have good service. And so, you know, if you have something like, if you've developed something like this where you're paying a lot of fees for people, and then when if we have a downturn or something like that, we're probably not gonna, we're probably not gonna take away this, the um, what we're giving to these folks. I mean, we're not gonna take that away. We're probably gonna continue to subsidize the fees, and we're gonna lower the contract amount. And then it's gonna be worse, really, for everybody in the community, those pe those seniors and and everyone else. And so, uh, we just gotta be real careful how we go forward with this, because it's. I mean, it's important. It's important service, but yes, it is. Um, in the big scheme of things, when budgets get tight, you guys know. You I know. Guys know you're the first ones yeah. to get get chopped, right? And so, yeah. I don't want to see the service level go down either. I think it's it's probably it's it's run the the place. I mean, to your credit, I I really respect you, Judy. You run the damn place on a shoestring, and I don't want to see it make it more difficult. Thank you. And I will check and make sure, confirm that we are returning all voicemail messages. Well, you're, because you're, I can promise start. you you're not. I know. I <laughs> well, that, <laughs> the dog we got need home. to fix that. The dog got <laughs> home. He was fine. Uh, and, and, and frankly, you know, it's kind yeah. of good because yeah. all, you know, face you know, we have tools to at our disposal. Mm -hmm. We don't always need you guys to come running and we took care of it. And so, but yeah, but yeah. it was, but I don't want to see anything to jeopardize the service levels for sure. No, no. And, and we do know, I recognize when you do surveys of services for the county, when the cities do those surveys, um, code enforcement and animal control tend to come pretty low down on the, on the list. And it makes sense. Because if you think about it, you don't, most community residents don't think about needing animal control services until they need them. Mm -hmm. They don't. We know that we need fire. We know that we need police. We know that we need roads to drive on. We know that we need emergency services. We, I think most people mm. think about those as really critical government services. They don't think about some of the other things until they become a problem for them personally. Right. Um, and But we know that. And so many of the other things that we do are actually mandated that we do them, and in, and frequently the level of service, the way that we provide the service, is actually um, mandated by statute. Mm -hmm. So you're you're one of the only pl places where we have a little bit of flexibility to kind of how we how we perform the service, and that's so that's sort of 
your problem as well. Yeah. I, oh, I, I know that. And I, I mean, and I, I worry about that um, just in terms of a downturn as well. And I don't, um, yeah. I appreciate the situation when those, those kind of economic circumstances mm -hmm. happen, this, the situation that you and your leadership team are in. Believe me, I, I understand. Well, in the city of Loveland, they will never take away that fee waiver, right? They will cut your contract instead, and they'll still continue to pay the, the senior <laughs> waiver. No, they will. I promise you. Because a year ago, they told me, we will help you pay the cost of the devil's backbone. Keep the devil's backbone a, 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 a fee-free area for day use by the people in the city of Loveland. That's who uses it. And guess what? Now what do they tell us? Well, we don't have any money to contribute to that. Sorry, county. So now go back in and put your stupid fee on county commissioners and look like bad guys. Mm -hmm. When they when they told, begged us to, that they would help us on that fee and they won't do it now, right? So speak, you know, be careful because you're going to have to provide the service. And and I know and I know what's I I know these guys by reputation. Mm -hmm. You'll be really careful, and we'll be careful too. We yeah. need to be careful too. All right. So, so to be clear, do you want me to come back next week I don't with know what this I want or? You to do. I don't know what I want. What do you want her to do? Or are you okay with moving forward, adding the? You want to talk to Steve first? Well, I think we certainly need to talk to Commissioner Johnson. Okay. But if the two of us are in agreement, I believe that's right. the required amount to be able to move right. forward. And that would, that amount of money would allow for a substantial number of people to cover the $10 increase. Yeah. And yeah. then I'd be happy to talk to Commissioner Johnson about this discussion Why if you like. Why don't you talk to him and make sure he's mm -hmm. not going to raise a stink? So then we should wait until she... Uh, is it, I think we can move ahead with the budget, yeah, yeah. and then if we can always take it out if he has a strong yeah, objection or please. discuss it again. Okay. okay. Yeah, we and then work with uh, Judy okay. and her team yeah. to and figure out uh, whether it's in a renewal notice to inform people right. and then okay. how to go about that. So it's 2500 bucks. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. So instead of $600,000, it'll be $6,200. Two thousand and fifty dollars or something. <laughs> Two thousand five. Potentially. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. That took a lot more time than the fire department. <laughs> Sprinkler thing. <laughs> you know, Animals been, always do. It should yeah. have been the tough thing, but we didn't. It wasn't. Okay. Well, great. Right. I don't Thank even you. know if you got done with your slides. Even, That's but, it. Yep. Okay. That's <laughs> it. Well, thanks. You got it. All right. Well, great to see you. Great thanks to for everybody you. for coming out. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Community development updates. Leslie, are you coming up? She is. Yep. You're a fun gal. You just, you always bring fun stuff. I don't have, um, Leslie Ellis, Community Development um, Director. And I don't have much for you today, but Matt has a quick update related to the code project and um, recruiting some folks to help with a technical advisory committee. Okay, so. Matt? Well, you make me responsible for all these things, so I gotta, no. you know, no. talk to you about. La at last week's Wednesday evening meeting, we talked about the kickoff of the code and whatnot, and there was a discussion about an advisory committee that evening. Yeah. Commissioner Donnelly, you suggested that maybe the board would want to appoint those, maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, I think we probably would at least want to <clears throat> bless them some way. We would like to come forward and just make a suggestion of the okay. members that we think should be on that board, and, and then uh, if you want to add or subtract from that, then we can, and then maybe we could bring that forward to you for a Tuesday adoption. I want to put that guy on there. Uh-huh. Kitty kitty. Hell of a Mauser, I bet. You know, I was I was thinking there was a lost kitty in my neighborhood a couple of weeks ago. He's about three foot tall and six foot long. Yeah. Yeah. He was over in the neighbor's backyard. Yeah. 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 It was pretty yeah. scary, but it was yeah, good. Right. Keep the dogs in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, John. Uh thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Matt. Uh my understanding is that uh you would like to go back and come up with a list of uh, recommendations regarding folks who might serve on this tech technical advisory committee. Yeah, I think he has some it's an advisory committee. We have a technical team, which is, is our staff, right. and, and, consultant. and and consultants and that. And the advisory committee would be somewhat like a stakeholders committee. Great. The difference between a stakeholders committee, from our perspective, when we did the comprehensive plan versus. Um, doing the land use code is that the comprehensive plan was about vision and mission and, and all the, the fluffy stuff that goes on with making our community a better place to live. <clears throat> the advisory committee that we're talking about as a stakeholders committee on this project, because this is technical in nature, we're trying to narrow it down to a group of people that 
we don't have to spend a lot of time bringing up to speed as to why there's regulations on this and that, but to talk directly to the issues because they're familiar with our codes and how we operate. Question is, in terms of the list of people that you are recommending, have you considered uh, diversity issues and gender balance issues? There, um, I, I just think that we need to really figure out a better way to make sure that all sectors of our community are represented. I, I understand you just said folks are up to speed on why we need to do these things, but that doesn't tend to be folks who aren't engaged in this already. Can you help me uh, sort through that? I, can I help you? Can I? Can well, we I, I guess I, I just want to make sure. Are we looking at it through the lens of how do we create uh, an advisory group, a stakeholder group that's diverse, uh -huh. and where there's some gender balance? Uh huh. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Well, this takes I'll care share of that. Share the list with you. Okay. Why don't you do that? So five members of the list start off with our planning commission um, because they're directly affiliated with the codes and whatnot. And um, five members of our planning commission. Five members. And let me explain each one of them real quick. Oh, you actually selected people, not just seats. You've actually already selected people. I, I'm suggesting some people, yes. Okay. Okay. Go if ahead. you'd be willing to listen. Well, uh, I guess. On I'm that. Sure. Nancy Wallace. Nancy Wallace brings to us two different things, a couple of different things. She's an attorney. She's been on our planning commission for a long time. She represents the Natural Resources She's Board. She's on the Open Lands Board. Open Lands Board, time. thank you. Mm -hmm. And she lives in the agricultural and rural parts of our community. And they're farmers. And, they're and deals a lot with that, that aspect scale. of our community. And she's very familiar with, with how regulation and use of the land use code very applies to development applications. And she happens to be a woman. Yes, sir. Well, yep. Have a chat. Sean Doherty. Sean Doherty is the chairman of the Planning Commission. He's a real estate um, professional. He works also on the uh, Red Feather Lakes Advisory Board. Um, so he represents a different geographic area for the county as well as just for... Ask, how many people are on this board. task force? I'm looking at uh, keeping it to 10. And five of them are planning commissioners? Possibly, unless you suggest otherwise. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, John Barnett's the most recent addition to our planning commission. He is a planner by trade. He's worked in the development um, field for a number of years and is familiar with our code and our operations. Mm -hmm. Courtney Statswitz is on our planning commission. She works for Jim Birdsall's office, so she's in the development community. Mm -hmm. um, is a landscape, a landscape architect by trade. And, and works directly with applying our land use regulations on projects now. <clears throat> Lindsay X. Lindsay X is an environmental planner with the City of Fort Collins Natural Resources Department. Um, she, prior to moving over to Natural Resources, was a planner in their planning department with an environmental background. She has a very strong environmental background. And uh, I think that uh, she knows how to administer regs by being in the planning profession and whatnot. So, the planning commission? Huh? She's no. On the planning commission? She was just on their staff. As no, I mean, she, but you I, only named. I, I oh, thought, I got one more. I, I got them out of order. I'm sorry. Hi, folks. are from the planning commission. Yeah, he only missed Ann them. Johnson. Ann Best Johnson. Um, Ann Johnson is in the, in the private sector. She represented in several projects, uh, gravel mining, Oil, gas, different things. Diff comes from a little bit different angle, but she knows how to administer eggs. I think she provides a, a solid background on there. Um, by name, Roger Morgan was another one that came up. Roger Morgan was a past planning commissioner for Larimer County. He serves on several water boards. He's uh, been an agriculture producer in the past and, uh, and worked in the banking industry, so he understands collateral and things like that that we work with, and, and he understands our regulations very well. And then I have four other options of openings, and one of them would I would be seeking somebody from um, either the Ag Advisory Board or somebody just from the Agricultural District. So uh, whether that's from one of these... Uh, groups, the uh, Farmers Alliance or any of those groups that have been talking to us recently about urban farming and other options um, for urban agriculture and agricultural industry. Um, I'm open on that. Engineer, uh, I'd be looking for an engineering 
person, somebody that comes in with an engineering background, understands transportation, drainage, floodplains, things like that, and how to administer those things. Uh, preferably would like to have somebody from an in the economic development um, profession, if possible. And so I'd be looking for a name on that and then maybe somebody from the housing sector. Um, and so there's four areas there that I don't have a name that popped right up for me. And if you'd offer suggestions, I'd be willing to consider them. Uh, is there a way, based on these, um, uh, this matrix of qualifications that would be desirable to have, uh, is there a way of, are there tools out there that allow us to uh, find people, let's say from the Latina, Latinx community that could meet those criteria? Uh, I mean, how, how would we go about that? How can we try to get someone on this body, which is so important, that represents uh, to some, you know, as best as one can represent a sector, uh, mm -hmm. the fact that 12 to 14 percent of our population is Latino? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's almost all in Fort Collins, though, too. Yeah. Well, and I might chime in. I mean, keep in mind, this is one of many ways that people can engage with the land use code and this is you know not the technical group there's another technical group but an advisory group if it would make sense at points along the way to do some focus groups or to do something that's more specific to particular issues or particular groups of folks to understand their concerns that would be a possibility too to supplement this work respect I appreciate that Leslie I, I just think that that's how we've always done it mm -hmm. I, I I'm wondering if we're looking for an engineer or if we're looking for a planner, mm -hmm. uh, can't we go to the statewide planning association or the, the, the regional planning association and say, from your membership, do you have some people you could recommend to serve on this body who might happen to be from the Latinx community or other communities that are often not represented on these, on these boards and commissions? I'll stop there. Well, well one engineer. Put my wife on there. One of the Her father was from Mexico. I don't think that she believes she speaks for all... Yeah. Hispanic people in this county, though, it's, certainly. It's not, yeah. Lee Martinez was a gentleman uh, that was uh, down at the uh, Landmark Engineering that I was thinking what, What's about. the name? No, his name Lee Paul, Martinez. His name is Paul Martinez. Oh, there's a Lee, too. Lee Martinez is a guy there's that Lee Martin. Park. Lee Martin, I think, maybe it is. In. It might not be. I think, isn't it, I think that you're talking about the land surveyor at, at Landmark. His name is Paul Martinez, isn't it? Well, there's Paul, a Paul Hernandez. Paul Hernandez. Paul Hernandez, and I think Lee Martinez works yeah. down there. Okay. He well, just worked with Michael Whitley on a project. And well, anyway, I think that I, I don't. I don't have a problem with that. I think that Leslie's right. If there's if there's specific issues, let's say um, issues about housing or 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 things that we can focus groups on, we will absolutely do that. But I don't have a problem if we can identify somebody. It's just that. This is very technical in nature, and, and to bring somebody in, we need to find somebody that, that's out there, and we and can I, contact and I would those groups. I would suggest that there, should, there are people out there who happen yeah, to be from a diverse background who mm -hmm. are, have the technical expertise. It's just that you know we're always so slammed with time and trying to get these things figured out. We can't take the extra time to, to, to make a few more phone calls and get people on there. I mean, I appreciate that it, it looks like we're looking at some pretty good gender balance uh, I think that's important, but I also think it's important that we have, uh, not that they're representing the entire community, but that they have that lens yep. through which to look. 12% uh, of our population, whether it's in Fort Collins or the county, is is uh, you know is Latinx. Mm -hmm. the, the land use code only applies to an incorporated county. So I might suggest this, Matt. I would like to suggest that you find um, maybe someone who runs a horse boarding facility or has something to do with the equine industry. And, you know, I think that's such a huge economic segment of our economy here. Um, and, you know, I, I think you mentioned Ag Advisory Board. That's okay. But I, I think it would be good to have, um, you know, I think maybe be good to have a feedlot owner or a dairy farmer or something like that. Um, you know, like a guy like John Slutsky maybe or something even if John wants that. But, uh, you know, but, I mean, that's a – it's becoming really, really difficult to farm in this county. It's becoming <clears throat> very difficult. There's, it's, profits are down, taxes are up, a lot of neighbor interactions and conflicts. Um, and so I think if, if you want to develop a code that's really going to preserve agriculture, we need to be serious about that. Mm -hmm. 
And so those folks have to have a seat at the table when we develop the rules. I, I absolutely agree. And mentioning Nancy Wallace as from the Planning Commission, she has an extensive ag background and is an attorney. I think it's a wonderful selection. And then if we're looking at someone, uh, you know, from either the Ag Advisory Council or someone like John Slutsky, that's another person who has a lot of experience in terms of those issues. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just suggesting that another category would be someone who fits these qualifications who happens to be from uh, um, another ethnic background or something. And, and I put a call in to Zach Thode, who's the um, chairman of the Ag Advisory Board, and started mm -hmm. talking to him about that. I know John Slutsky's currently um, on our oil and gas committee and whatnot, so I, I, you know, I just don't want to overwhelm certain people yeah. either by putting them – repeating the same people on board after yeah, right. board after board sometimes well, but i mean there's hortons and there's there's yeah. other people like that that guys. certainly can Not be contacted. Anymore, but... um but again we we want to spend more time focusing on on code related stuff and right. not talking about vision of the county any longer we're moving right. in how to implement that and how to get the right regulations in place and and talk on a very technical level and that's why we were trying to be strategic in how we look at the people that we bring right. online. That's why I think you need to be, I think you need to take a hard, serious hard look at people that actually operate businesses, equine businesses, for example, <coughs> you know, I threw out there, but businesses in general in the county, because I don't think you're going to, you know, <laughs> one of the planning commissioners t said to me um, last week, she's, this person said, you know, I, she said, it, it's, it, this is always just all focused on growth. And, and, and I said, but there hadn't been any growth in the county in 20 years. There hasn't been. There hadn't been a sub I haven't done a subdivision in 10 years that I've been in the office. I've not done one subdivision. The growth occurs in the cities. There's no growth in the counties. All those all of those um, conservation developments happened in the 90s, or most of them. The early 2000s, yeah. yeah. Or very early 2000s. Prior to the and downturn. Then, there's no damn development that happens in the county. All we'll, we're going to do today is lot line adjustments and easement vacations and things like boundary line adjustments. There's hardly ever, I mean, just a lot here and there, but very, very minor subdivision even occurs in the county. And, this, and the fact is, is that there's no water. Okay. Most of the water is owned by the cities now. We see all this irrigated farm ground out there. Guess what? It's being farmed with water that's owned by the city of Fort Collins. People don't know that. So there's not going to be any development, really, or not very much. But the one thing you could continue to have and, and would be very beneficial for the for the economy would be if we had a, a focus on, on some you know kind of aspects of, of businesses you could actually have in the county. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you need to, I think you need to prioritize that, maybe. I don't know. That's just my take. And that, for, forgive me for belaboring this, but uh, and I, I, if, if the decision is to prioritize that, of course, and a business person, of course, and I would just add to that, try to find a business person who happens to be um, uh, from that 12% of our, our population, whether it's in the county or not. We're still all in this together. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, that's Ben Connell. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on that. He's raised on the uh, Wind River Reservation. Okay. Or a Native American person or whatever. Yeah. Just an underrepresented... Mm -hmm. Uh, minority group in these boards and commissions. That's all. Thank you very much. He for is this. a minority group. He's in one percenter. <laughs> with the list that we had going to start with, are you okay with the names that we've presented so far? I don't far? know. Can you send us an email? Yes. And, and list it for us yes. so we can look at it. I was trying know. to get it done sooner and later because I'd like to have a meeting with them on Thursday, but yeah, that's probably it not going to happen. That so gonna happen. I'm just not going to worry about yeah, that. Yeah, don't do that. Move on with send it things. to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else? That was it for me. <laughs> And then today, yep. land use. Yep, we've got four consent. Four items, items on consent. Estes okay. related. Very good. Chairman. Yes. I got an update by text from where the city of Fort Collins is currently with the age subsidy for licenses. Okay. And they have 69 individuals that have qualified the first seven months. On average, if I remember correctly, it's 800 to 1,000 renewals go out for this population each month in Fort Collins. Um, and so it's about 1% of those folks that are seeking okay. renewal. Okay. So the 2,500 seems to be reasonable for our okay. load. 69 that they've waived the fee for? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that information. Very good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Have a moment of your sure. time. Yeah. And I need to talk to you, too. Okay. okay.
So, yeah? What the hell? <laughs> now you guys are crazy. You've gone crazy. <laughs> now you want me to recuse myself? Put it in here.